Good evening. Welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. It's lovely to see you all here. It's lovely to have everyone uh, who are joining us online. Uh, tonight we continue on with our teaching series uh, called The Apostle Paul. Tonight, this is the 10th uh, lesson on this series. It's called The Apostle Paul and Barnabas Visit Jerusalem. Now you may notice that often in the Bible it talks about the Apostle Paul, but if you read carefully it's actually the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Barnabas as well. Um, however, leading statements tend to just see the Apostle Paul being written. In this scene that's described here, we find that they return to Jerusalem after their first mission trip, which we'll speak about in a moment, to have a council of the church to discuss the issues around the early church. We've got Jews and <coughs> excuse me, Jews and Gentiles joining the church alike. And of course there was separation between them because of beliefs and also because of God's covenant. Um, and so they're a bit perplexed and probably argumentative about what's the right thing to do. So tonight we're going to begin to explore that. Uh, in the course of this teaching, we're reading a book also called Paul. It's a novel by Walter Wongeren Jr. And it is a book that's readily available. You can get an e-book, you can get an audio book. You can buy a paperback uh, or you can get this on hardback. You can get secondhand copies online, so it's readily available. So if you're interested in reading this, uh, we are reading uh, from this con constantly in conjunction with the Bible. So as we begin tonight, as I said, this is the 10th lesson. Um, and as I mentioned, it's when Paul and Barnabas return to Jerusalem after their mission trip and but before they returned to Jerusalem their mission trip came to a close when they arrived back at Antioch in Syria which is where we we finished up so tonight we're going to be reading the Bible from Acts chapter 15 we'll be reading verses 1 to 22 and from the novel Paul we're going to be reading from pages 131 to 147 but before we launch into the scripture itself tonight's teaching and readings address the divide that confronts the early Christian congregations who are made of both Jews and Gentiles alike reading the book of Acts as we are can be of a great benefit in understanding the challenges that face the church as it grew and developed and there is a significant benefit for us today as well because many of the issues remain as relevant today as they did back then but they also help us to understand how we are to practice our faith and so um, items such as circumcision remain an issue today people still question should we or shouldn't we do we have to or don't we have to and so these are topics which do remain in the church today. Now later from their return from the Syrian city of Antioch, Paul and Barnabas have just returned from their first missionary trip. They are thrilled that God, as it says in Acts 14 verses 26 and 27 that we looked at in the previous lesson, they are thrilled that God has opened to the nations the door to faith is what the scriptures tell us. So opened to the nations the door to faith. So in other words, this is now not a faith which belongs in the land of Israel itself, but now it's a faith that belongs to the nations, to the whole world. Antioch itself is abuzz with the good news and a great number of Gentiles are being added to the congregation here, as it says in Acts chapter 11, verse 20 to 26, which we've already read it said it mentions a great number so biblically a great number is a very large number and so it doesn't mean just a few people it could mean many thousands of people this exciting news about this influx has reached Judea which of course Jerusalem is the capital of at this time but instead of bringing joy to all this development forces into prominence the ongoing debate about circumcision what should be the relationship between Jewish and non-Jewish believers? 
And how should former Gentiles view the Mosaic law, which has never applied to them in their past? The issue causes dissension so strong between various people and leaders in the new church that it becomes so serious that it actually threatens to split the Christian congregation into factions just as fast as they're beginning to form. And this is why, of course, we find that Paul starts sending out letters to the church as we read in the Bible. So how is this matter resolved is in this account from the book of Acts and we can learn many valuable lessons from studying it and potentially use this wisdom to act wisely should potentially divisive issues arise within the church today. Now Acts 15.1, which we're going to read in a moment, commences with this phrase that says, unless you get circumcised. So we can ask what wrong views were certain believers promoting and what questions does this raise? The disciple Luke wrote, certain men came down to, to Antioch from Judea and began to teach the brothers, unless you get circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And so this is uh, quite a bewildering statement. They make it categorical that unless you get circumcised according to the Mosaic law, you cannot be saved. So what do we think about that? Is that the case? No. Is that what Jesus no. said? No, it's not. And yet here these gentlemen are in the early church, but they're Jewish men first who've converted their faith to understand that Jesus is the Messiah, but they're still saying that the way to practice your faith is bound by the Mosaic law. And so predating the law given to God, that, sorry, God gave to Moses, and later becoming part of it, circumcision obviously began with whom? Who was the first person commanded to circumcise in the Bible? Abraham. Abraham. And he was to circumcise whom? His, his son. His son, Ishmael. Is that all? No. He was, he was also the first. All his servants, everyone. All his servants. All his servants and everyone. Were they all bloodline descendants of Abraham? No, they weren't. And so we find in that this first premise that the Jewish people are using, they're saying, well, it doesn't matter whether you're a Gentile or a Jew, because Abraham made his whole household circumcised, whether aliens, as they're called in the language, or not, then you should be circumcised as well. And so this becomes part of the argument. Uh, if you want to read about that, it's in Leviticus chapter 12, verses 2 to 3. Now, under the Mosaic law, as I said, even aliens had to be circumcised before they could enjoy certain privileges, such as eating the Passover meal. So there's a lot about this in the book of Exodus in chapter 12. And indeed, in the Jewish mind, for a man to be uncircumcised, it says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 1, that they would be unclean and contemptible. And so you can see why there was such a powerful argument that was occurring between the people. Thus, it required faith and humility on the part of Jewish believers to adjust to what is known as a revealed truth, meaning that it's a truth that changed because Jesus revealed the change, who came later than when this was written. Now, the law has been replaced, which is the old covenant, by a new covenant. So birth as a Jew no longer made people automatically one of God's children anymore. And so this is a significant shift. Mm -hmm. And for Jewish Christians who lived in Jewish communities, as did the believers in Judea, it took courage for these people to confess Christ and to accept as fellow believers Gentiles who had not been circumcised. So there's the challenge. There's also some scriptural references in Jeremiah chapter 31 for this and in Luke chapter 22. So this is prevalent throughout the Bible, all of these issues, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Now, of course, God's standards haven't actually changed. Reflecting this truth, the new covenant incorporated the spirit of the Mosaic law. And again, you can read about this in Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 to 40. In regard to circumcision, for example, Paul later wrote in the book of Romans, 
He is a Jew who is on the inside, and his circumcision is that of the heart by spirit and not by a written code. And so Paul has shifted the physical circumcision into a circumcision of the spirit. And so this is a significant change. Now the certain men from Judea who had not grasped these truths but asserted that God had never revoked the law of circumcision, what do you think? Are they going to listen? And the problem is no, they're not. Because they were born Jews first and they obviously, this is all that they know. Mm. And so it's a big, big challenge at the time. Now even after the first century governing body settled the circumcision issue, certain of it individuals who claimed to be Christians stubbornly kept this question alive. So the Apostle Paul called them false brothers who wanted to pervert the good news about the Christ. This is mentioned in the book of Galatians in chapter 1, in chapter 2 and in Titus chapter 1. So again Paul called them false brothers who wanted to pervert the good news about the Christ. Which means that they've accepted Christ but they're changing it. They're perverting it. So in other words, they want the bits that they want, but they don't want the bits that they choose not to have. And of course, we can't do that. So the, the objective apparently seems to be to appease the Jews, because obviously it's the Jews who are not accepting the Gentiles. And so it becomes a process of appeasement to keep them from opposing Christianity violently. And again, in the book of Galatians, it talks about this in chapter 6. These Judaizers, as you could call them, argued that righteousness was established by the works of the Mosaic law in such matters as diet, circumcision and Jewish festivals. And so the issue that we have here is they're saying, well, we accept Jesus as the Messiah, but our ceremonial laws stay put. They don't change. And so, again, this only served to cause more problems. So understandably... Those who held to these views felt uncomfortable in the presence of Gentile believers because this is all that they'd ever known. Sadly, such unwholesome feelings were even manifest among a number of reputable Christians of Jewish background. For example, when representatives from the Jerusalem congregation visited Antioch, they kept separate from their Gentile brothers. They didn't join in with them. Even Peter, who until then had freely socialised with the Gentiles, he decided to withdraw, Mm. not even eating with them. So yes, he went against the very principles that he had earlier defended, so he flipped. And as a result, Peter received strong counsel, we'll call it, from the Apostle Paul. And you can read about that also in the book of Galatians chapter 2. So in Galatians, you can pick up on a lot of these issues. Mm. So the issue of circumcision is taken to the governing body in Jerusalem. So they're up there in Antioch, Paul and Barnabas and many other people. And from there, they went out and did their first mission trip. They came back and they were all arguing. And so they decided that they needed a resolution if they were going to have unity to go forward as the church. So in Acts 15 too, as it says, it says, When there had occurred no little dissension and disputing by Paul and Barnabas with them, which is the certain men, they, meaning the elders, arranged for Paul and Barnabas and some others of them to go up to the apostles and older men in Jerusalem regarding this dispute. So obviously they were looking to resolve it once and for all. So the dissension and disputing reflects strong feelings. That's what it is when you dissent or dispute and firm convictions on both sides. And the congregation in Antioch could not resolve it. In the interest of peace and unity, the congregation wisely arranged to take the question to the apostles and the older elders in Jerusalem who made up what was their governing body at that time. So it's at this point that we're going to turn to tonight's scripture and we're going to begin reading from the book of Acts chapter 15 and we're going to read through to from chap from sorry from verse 1 through to verse 21. Okay. 
So it's kind of necessary to speak about this to sort of set the the scene, so to speak, to understand the context in which we're receiving this scripture and this teaching. So verse 1 of chapter 15. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, saying, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them all. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and they travelled through Phoenicia and Samaria. They told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the brothers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. And so obviously in their passage they were sharing good news. They were sharing how the church was growing and people were receiving and people were being healed. Verse 5, Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. So this now tells us that there is Pharisees who have now converted to following Christ. Of course, Paul is one of them. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? Interesting, isn't it? Because he just said that they purified their hearts by faith, and then he says, why do you put a yoke on? And refers back to the ceremonial and physical laws. Verse 11, no, we believe, and here's the issue, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. So it kind of seems to flip a little bit here. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written, After this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent, its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the remnant of men may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who does these things that have been known for ages. And so... We get this clear message through this, you know, let's call it a referral to something that was written in the Bible earlier in the piece. He goes on to say, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. And so in this reading, we start to see a distinction being set between the Gentiles and the Jews. So they're saying we both recognize the Messiah as our saviour. However, we want to practice our religion differently based on the laws of the past. So they're now saying to the Gentiles that they should receive some of the Jewish laws, but they're not willing to give up some of the laws to meet with the Gentiles. And so again, we just see this constant separation between the two. Okay, so let's now go to the novel Paul. And the writing here is going to explore these issues a bit further in the form of a, a dialogue. 
So we begin on page 131, on chapter 24, and it opens by saying, James in Jerusalem to Simon Peter in Caesarea. Please, throw off your cloak of hiding a while, and come with deliberate, with deliberate speed to Jerusalem. Saul of Tarsus and Joseph Barnabas are presently travelling hither from Antioch. By what route I do not know, whether by land or by sea, I do not know. It is possible that they shall put in at the port of Caesarea and even be near to you by the time you read this letter. But I desire that you come here ahead of them. We must discuss the things that are happening in Antioch before we confront its leaders. Sounds like people who want to align their story before they have an argument. Continuing on, feeling in Jerusalem, feelings in Jerusalem are running high. They always do, of course, and we do well to live in discipline and so to maintain stability despite the ferocities of the city. But I'm referring to the feelings of our own communities. Last month, Judas Barsabbas returned from Antioch in a fury filled with condemnations. He had gone there on his own reconnaissance, meaning I didn't send him, talking about James as the head of the church there, to greet Saul and Barnabas. So he said, at the conclusion of their year-long journey to Cyprus and provinces north, he, like Saul, is a Pharisee. He protests that he wanted to open a dialogue with the man who had studied under Rabban Gamaliel. Barsabbas himself was refused by that great teacher. Now Barsabbas is back pulling on his beard and telling me how astounded he was to discover that the believers in Antioch are despised by the synagogues and rejected as apostates and blasphemers. Jews, Barsabbas says, have divided into two bodies having nothing to do with each other. The believers, who are now called Christians, swell their numbers with Greeks and pagans straight from the streets while the synagogues shrink before God-fearing Gentiles and proselytes are deserting them. And the Lord God, Barsabbas thunders, for the house churches sick with laxity. Deserting the Lord God, Judas Barsabbas thunders, because in Antioch, these Christians teach that Gentiles don't have to be circumcised. Baptism is enough, and Jesus is all. Barsabbas paces in my little room in great agitation. They can ignore the law, he says. Why, inside their house worshipping churches, I have seen the clean and the unclean sitting side by side, eating flesh that was killed with the blood in it, eating meats that were slaughtered and butchered in pagan ritual. And the loudest leader of all, Barsabbas says, pulling his beard and shaking his head, is, of course, Saul of Tarsus. <laughs> Oh, remember in the previous reading, it's, it uh, explained him eating uh, pork. Um, and so, obviously, Barsabbas is highly offended. Oh, I had hoped to admire him, but I have found him preaching directly to the pagans, teaching nothing of Israel, nothing of Moses, nothing at all of Abraham, nor does he require anything of these pagans for their salvation, except that they believe in Jesus, dead and risen and coming soon. Simon, you and I both know Judas Barsabbas, how passionate and unrestrained he can be. But I tell you, his heart is good. He truly yearns for the salvation of every people. And he fears that Saul is perverting the word so wretchedly that the pagans who trust him will not receive salvation. So he, Barsabbas, stayed in Antioch half the year, arguing publicly against Saul and Barnabas and teaching people directly that unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. So you can imagine, how well did you think this fared for new believers? Mm. Do we have the same situation happening today? Churches divided, churches teaching different denominations, churches with different doctrines, different dogmas, and people saying, unless you are baptised only in the name of Jesus, for example then you're not a Christian, things I've certainly seen and read myself. And so it's disgraceful. So this continues to today, just as it was back in this time. He tells me that God has granted him some success. He has caused many people to question the leadership in Antioch 
and some have openly withdrawn from Saul and Barnabas, but he believes that this is not enough. And so this is the consequence. When people who are meant to be unified in their faith decide that they're going to argue about it in front of other people and have division, then I don't know how they expect that people are going to join with them. Okay? And this is one of the problems with Christianity today. There are other religions who would say, well, why would you want to become a Christian? Because they don't even agree with one another. And it's true. And so something for us all to think about. So Judas Barsabas has delivered his angry speeches everywhere among believers here in Jerusalem. During this last month, he has stirred up the passions, especially of the Pharisees among us. He wants to purify the church, he says, and wash the name of Jesus clean of these treacherous lies. He argues that even the Greek-speaking Stephen never broke from the synagogues, nor has Stephen's people, Philip, Timon and Prochorus, ever gone anywhere except to those who would know and worship the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I must tell you, Simon, that Barsabas is not alone in his fears. He's only the most emotional. And now I hear that Antioch is sending a delegation to Jerusalem to argue its own cause. Saul and Barnabas are on their way, accompanied by some young Gentile. Word of their coming and of their intensity precedes them here. Oh, may the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ give us the words and wisdom in the clash to come. And so here again, another issue. People proclaim the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ in agreement with their point of view. Mm. Right? Do you think the Lord's going to give them wisdom when they do that? I don't think so. We don't proclaim things in the Lord's name based on our own opinion. And yet this is an issue as well today. Do you know where Thomas is? I haven't heard from Thomas in 18 months. Bring Philip. Let your wife remain behind. Don't endanger her. Travel light. Please, Simon, hurry. Okay. So the next short chapter is titled with Titus. It's chapter 25, page 135. And he says, I'm out of breath. I can hardly keep up. Barnabas had said we should ship south. Paul said, no, we're going to walk. Barnabas said, why? Paul said, so as to talk to everyone on the way. So clearly, this young Gentile fellow is, of course, Titus, which was just mentioned by James. And that's what we've been doing. Hardly a day's break. No rest. It's the rainy season, but Paul wakes up before dawn and takes off running Rain or shine, or it seems to me it's running. We follow Lickety Split. At noon he comes to a village where some believers live. How does he know how where all the believers live? In question mark. And we go to their house. We eat a little lunch and Paul tells his story. I mean the story of meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus. I mean he's got a pretty good testimony. You've got to give it. You know, like who else has got a testimony like Paul? Right? Tends to work a tree. <laughs> The farther south we go, the more is the people who've never seen Paul face to face. So for them, it's a wonderful tale. I hear it over and over. Paul says, I persecuted the church of God. I tried to destroy it. He says, I was so zealous for the traditions of the Jews that I advanced in religion past everyone my own age. You hear that? I advanced in religion past everyone my own age. Then he slaps the table or something and he says, but God set me apart before I was born and when I was travelling on the road to Damascus, he revealed his son to me. Jesus of Nazareth appeared to me and said, Saul, Saul, and call me to be an apostle, apostle to the Gentiles. That's it. That's what Paul says wherever we stop. And sometimes the people cry right there, mumbling tears of happiness at the change in him. Always and everywhere they say, praise God, glory to God the Father. Things like that. Then Paul goes on to tell them what happened when he and Barnabas preached to the pagans, how the Holy Spirit came to the pagans the same as the Jews, and then our hosts really go wild. Can you notice here this use of the word pagans? It always sets a tone, doesn't it? That they're not going to accept these people. Right? It's a derogatory word. Everybody starts to sing hymns, and if someone yells, in the name of Jesus, well... 
Then I do my thing, which is this funny little dance, and I speak in tongues. The Holy Spirit makes me speak in tongues. I say to Paul, why am I invited? What do I do when we get to Jerusalem? He says to me, nothing, do nothing. Well, that's a poser. So I say, I don't get it. He looks me dead in the eye then and says, Titus, says my solemn name, uh, so he says my name, solemn and serious and scared even. It seems to me it's scared. Titus, he says, the gospel I preach to the Gentiles must not be preached in vain. I cannot be running in vain. Some false brothers have been spying on our freedom, which we have in Christ Jesus. So here's that mention of the false brothers. They want to bring us back to bondage. They want to make my preaching into nothing. But you, little brother, you are my proof. It's who you, you are, what you do, what has not been done to you. It's the proof of the power of Jesus. Well, and when he says that, the only thing going through my mind is, at your speed, the running's not in vain, it's doing a bang-up job of killing me. So I told that joke to Barnabas, who usually has a sense of humour, but this time he says to me, no, but Saul means it. And I want to say, I know he means it, that's the point. But Barnabas is already galloping after Saul. The big man after the little man, like a bear after the desert hare. So I take off to the youngest man of all, Barely keeping up. So, interesting, isn't it? Paints a good picture. Okay, chapter 26, titled by the name of Barnabas. And so we're going to have the point of view of Barnabas now. Judas Barsabas said, I am a Jew. So from this straight away, we established they've arrived in Jerusalem and they're going to have this contest. I believe they have. Let me just check. So Saul shot, sorry, shot to his feet, and I am not, I am as Hebrew as anyone here. People in Jerusalem do not stand to speak. So yes, of course, he's in Jerusalem. That's what the Greek rhetorician does. Rabbis teach sitting down. Jesus taught sitting down. So when Saul kept flying to his feet, he got attention, all right, but not the sort he wanted. Saul pointed at Judas Barsabas and cried, Are you an Israelite? He pounded on his skinny chest. So am I. I reached up to tug at Saul's arm. Saul, I whispered, Saul. Simon Peter spoke more boomingly from his other side. I can't wait to hear what you have to say, brother, he called. I know how powerful your words will be, but listen first to shape them best. Please, Saul, sit. Saul sat down again between me and young Titus. I declare it with praise for him and to God that he shackled himself in spiritual chains then, and he listened. With praise for Saul, I say, and a little relief for my side, myself, because we were here as ambassadors for Antioch, and I'd been put in charge, but my partner, Apostle, had a habit of charging over everyone. Oh, I hoped he'd keep the shackles on, but he sat in a sort of crouch, his narrow eye fixed on our opponent, Judas Barsabas. He had a long scraggly beard which he stroked when he talked he was a gray fellow not much blood in him so his excitements always seem strange to me like ice cracking i am a jew judas barsabas said again i was born a jew circumcised on the eighth day and named for the maccabean that savior of old israel who always always even under the severest circumstances obeyed and honored the laws of god like him, I was trained to observe the laws and since the year of my own majority have kept the feast, have avoided impurities, have eaten nothing unclean, have rested on Shabbat, have meditated on the law both day and night. I am a Jew. I was born an Israelite, one of the people chosen by God. And so he's clearly declaring his bloodline descendancy and the Mosaic laws. The man paused to rearrange his robe. He said, but now, in the name of Jesus, I am twice a Jew and twice the Israelite. And how, he asked with a cold smile, can that be? We were sitting on long benches, some of stone built into the walls, some my plain wood in the rest of the room. The wooden benches gave out a faint smoke scent as if they'd been salvaged from a burnt building. They were smooth with age. A room as large as this was unusual in the houses of Jerusalem, but my Aunt Mary had knocked down a whole wall in order to create a place for the assembly of many believers at once. G 
Judas Barsabas sat on stone in the northern corner. And how can that be, he said, turning his grey face this way and that, though he didn't look into our eyes. He seldom looked people in their eyes. He peered at our throats or the hair on our heads and answered his own question. Because I have come to the Jew of Jews, because I believe in the Israelite whom God the Father chose at last and best of all, the very fulfilment of Israel, for God who chose Abraham, the God who chose Israel to be his people, the God who chose prophets to call the people back against again, this same God who cannot deny his own nature, has testified to that holy nature by choosing once more forever and for all, as the crown and the consequence of all his choosings, God has chosen Jesus of Nazareth to be his son, his beloved one, the Messiah. And what, brothers and saints, does that mean? Why, well, it means that we are in Israel, in Israel, and we ought, therefore, to be eleven for the whole. Saul was listening. Every fibre in his skinny body vibrated almost imperceptibly, yet he kept his eyes fixed on Barsabas. James cast glances back and forth between the two Pharisees, once he caught my eye and seemed to question me as to my feelings. I returned a pinched smile. I really didn't know what I felt. I don't like Judas Barsabas. He's a contentious individual, unkind and unhumble. But I confess that his words were moving me, and all at once I discovered this vagrant thought through within my heart, how good to be home again. We had gathered in the house of my old Aunt Mary, the mother of my cousin, John Mark. There wasn't a better place in Jerusalem. She kept a large courtyard just inside the street gate, and this room, once it was enlarged, could hold 30 to 40 people. But for me, the house was a homecoming. After I had sold my properties and given all my possessions away, it was Mary who took me in and blessed me and fed me. The red paintings on her walls, therefore, and the mosaics on her floors, the smell of her bins and her baskets, the woven garlic, dried petals in a bowl, the menorah carved in a ceiling beam with shofroth on either side, the iron sconces, the pale blue lamps. These were the stuff of comfort for me. How good to be home again. And here were the people of that blazing Pentecost 19 years ago. Apostles and prophets, disciples and teachers and friends whom I hadn't seen in a decade. The very same people who in, their, in the first explosive, sorry, explosions of the Holy Spirit had thrown back their heads and uttered tongues they'd never known before, nor would ever know again. Here in Mary's house on benches around me sat men with old scars, for we all in those early days rejoiced to be beaten, rejoiced to be worthy to suffer dishonour for the name of Jesus. Simon Peter sat behind my brother Saul, James occupied a seat alone. John, the son of Zebedee, whose brother was murdered for the faith, sat between his mother and Mary Magdalene, now awfully thin and white-haired. All around the room were the faces of those first days before the persecutions scattered us. Grave, consoling faces, my old Aunt Mary and John Mark and Philip and Andrew and Matthias and the young Rose Rhoda whose crooked nose I loved when she was six, and I was the man she knew best, a sort of a father. All these had returned to Jerusalem one more time for the sake of the unity of the church. Oh, what a goodly company, and how good to be home again. Only one figure here in Mary's assembly room had not been with us at the beginning. Not with us, I mean, though he lived in the city, prowling the streets like Satan. Saul of Tarsus. Crouched beside me as tense as a cat, his red-rimmed eyes fixed on Judas Barsabas, his fierce black eyebrow quivering. I know the Messiah whom God has chosen, Barsabas was saying. I believe in Jesus, Lord and Saviour, and the consummation of Jewish expectations. Brothers and saints, we are Israel in Israel, for we have in Jesus the kernel of the nut. He is the seed in the flower, the hearth in the house. In him we have more than the promises of God, we have the fulfilment of every promise. In Jesus the law and the prophets are made complete and are therefore more beautiful and more binding than ever. Believing in Jesus divides me not one whit from my people. Rather, he is the next word in our history and the last one too. 
Many have come among us claiming to be the Messiah, the anointed of the Lord our God. The difference between them and Jesus is simple and singular. Jesus is. As if the book of the law had just been opened, some of the people murmured, Amen, Amen. Barsabas twitched his moist eye to those that had spoken. And what else should the church say, he asked them. What else need the church preach to anyone, Jew or Gentile? We declare that Jesus is finally the flower of a strong and ancient tree, and we who believe in him are its fruit. Why would anyone strive to cut that tree down? Several voices said, no one wants to cut it down. Who wants to cut it down? Barsabas said it would kill the flower and the fruit as well. Now he lifted his right hand and pointed at Saul, but this man thinks the flower can live without the tree. He spat the words in an icy logic. This man wants to plant an Israel apart from Israel, as if God would reject his people, as if God could deny himself. This man denies the needs of the law of God for the salvation of the Gentiles, as if God could deny his own nature. But God, Barsabas, raised his milky voice, sent Jesus as a Jew to the Jews, that we might love him and keep his name pure, and as Jews invite the nations to come and to love him too. And so we see there that he's keying into this whole journey of Jesus, where initially that they did come to serve the people of Israel. And so he's recognising that, but obviously not recognising what came next. For by coming to Zion, may every people be saved. God chose Jesus, a descendant of Abraham, that by Abraham, as God himself says, all the families of the earth might bless themselves. And this is how they come to Zion, by keeping the laws of Moses. And this is how they love the Messiah, by keeping the laws of Moses. And this is how in Abraham, every family on earth can bless itself, by knowing and honouring and obeying and keeping the laws of Moses. Circumcision, Barsabas intoned, is absolutely necessary for salvation. Amen, God has spoken. This is a prophet indeed. Pale Judas Barsabas was done, but the room still echoed his sound and his sense, first in shoutings and then in personal conversations, head to head. It had been an argument empowered as much by cold anger and passion as by substance, but the substance was real and the people now chattered in passions of their own. Rhoda the maiden, my little rose, brought out flagons of wine which she had mixed with honey and water. She placed baskets of dried fruit around the room, scattered fresh mint leaves, then poured cups of the wine for everyone. She saved the prettiest cup and the shyest, most charming of smiles for Titus, who sat grinning like a split melon. <laughs> Under other circumstances, I would have burst into laughter and teased the exchange, but I was preoccupied. Barsabas' words had an obvious and positive effect on people. James and Peter and John had gone off to a corner where they were locked in a low dialogue. Other people munched and laughed with an easy confidence as if matters had already been settled. This was distressing. I was beginning to realise how much Saul and I were seen as aliens. We'd taken routes, routes no one else was taking, and now we had come here to lay before them the truth of our gospel to the Gentiles, here in the central and holiest place of the faithful. And Titus, himself innocent of the fierce history of the Jews, had come as evidence of the rightness of our differences. I looked at Saul, he did not look back. His huge head hung low. He seemed so sunken in private meditations that my anxieties increased and I felt faintly lonely. Peter, James and John, the pillars of the church as Saul called them, returned to their places and sat down. If I could have read their expressions, I'd have called them concerned. But that was too much like my own mood and I rejected it. Peter said, Brother Saul, Others in the room reacted, directing their attentions to Peter and to Saul, but my partner didn't seem to notice anything. Again, Peter said, Saul. Saul jumped as if startled. He raised his face and that beetling brow and looked around the room with such a slow and kindly expression that the people fell silent in anticipation. 
Suddenly, I knew that Saul had been fervently alert the whole time, only seeming lost in thought. He spoke in a general manner, embracing the whole room. I can speak now. It is granted me to speak now. Peter smiled uncomfortably as if waiting for anyone else to answer, then said yes. But Saul looked over at James and said, The things that we have done and seen in the name of Jesus, they can be presented now to the church. James nodded. Thank you, thank you, Saul said. He stood up with a precise formality as short men are wont to do. Whether I need answer the, the changes of the brother, sorry, the charges of the brother who has just spoken, we will yet see. That time may come, or the time and the need may never come. For my own part, I'd like to begin by introducing with joy my friend and my helper, Titus. Saul gestured to the ruddy, innocent youth beside him. Saints, would you greet this new saint, Titus? In several languages, the people did. Shalom, they said. Irene, peace be with you. Ave. Thank you, Saul said. Then as if the idea had just entered his mind, he said, And what if I should ask my young friend here to speak? What if Titus told you of our successes abroad in the name of Jesus? Poor Titus went as white as almond blossoms. Peter strove to be jovial. Of course he boomed. Because the Holy Spirit is in this young man, you know, Saul said, his enthusiasm growing. Titus is a Gentile filled with the Holy Spirit. Surely that should give him leave to speak in this good fellowship, this body of broad repute. Surely that should give us all good reason to credit his witness as truth, right? Right, right, boomed Simon. Anyone in whom the Spirit dwells is worthy to address us. We will listen. Simon, Peter and I are much alike in tense situations. We both want desperately to be agreeable. When we worship in the house of Antioch, Saul was saying, Titus worships with us. And whenever the Spirit blows through the congregation, young Titus also receives a measure of the Spirit. He takes part in the celebrations fully as Barnabas or I, though we preach. That's our sign of the Spirit, to preach. Titus has his sign too, his own manifestation of the Spirit of God. Good for you, boom Simon Peter. Ah, lad, we look forward to worshipping with you tonight. In Peter's wake, a host of people smiled at Titus, murmuring praises to God. Indeed, indeed, Saul responded, young Titus has faith in Jesus, for he confesses that Jesus died for his sins and he declares that Jesus rose again for his salvation. Indeed, indeed, young Titus is a believer like us, for it was that brought his father to hear the gospel. This child was father of the man, and the gospel now shines in the parent's face. People began to applaud. Titus, too, was nodding and answering their praises with breathless pleasures of his own. His young eyes grew bright with thanksgiving. Saul grinned and said, He walks in the light, though he is no Jew. The people said, Amen. Saul said, And this is the reason why Titus is here. He is a living example of the effect of our preaching the gospel we preach to the Gentiles. We did not go out on our own, Barnabas and I. We were chosen by the Holy Spirit and sent by the church at Antioch as apostles. And this young Gentile, Titus, represents the fruit of our labours. He is but one of hundreds and hundreds who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Titus, and isn't he also united with everyone here? Behold how he delights in salvation. The whole assembly began to clap. One or two let out whoops of good cheer. I saw Titus' chin trembling with emotion. It caused me too suddenly to sob because I understood. Here in Jerusalem, the church and the apostles themselves were receiving him, granting the lad both place and love at once. Saul rode the noise of the people as if they were the sea and he a ready boat. Behold how Titus delights in salvation. He sang out, for it is with an unmixed gladness that he too anticipates the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, the people answered. And here is a sign of salvation and faithfulness, Saul said, a sign as good as any. 
Young Titus does not fear the coming of Jesus. He does not fear the judgment. He thirsts for it. He is like us. He too is hungry to see the face of our Lord. Amen, little brother. Amen. A woman rose up and came to Titus and took his hands and caused him to stand. Then she hugged him and kissed him in a transport of gladness while others spoke his name, commending him ever more loudly to God. I felt the gladness in me too, like a deep wave of breathing, a huge and wonderful sighing. I began to rock and deep in my bosom to sing. Then I saw young Rhoda out in the courtyard dancing round and round, lifting her arm like blossoms, and lo, the rhythm of her feet was the rhythm of my own internal song. And Saul was speaking in his high voice, We venture to tell you nothing except what Christ has worked through us to win obedience from the Gentiles. Amen, amen. What Christ has worked through us, Saul cried, by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the preaching of the gospel of Christ. Hallelujah. Blessed be, Saul cried, and spontaneously Simon Peter finished the phrase, Blessed be the holy name of Jesus, Saul called out again, Blessed be. It's interesting, if you actually think through all of this dialogue, what's happening is Saul is actually not entering down a rabbit warren with Mm -hmm. Barsabas. He's not entering into an argument to dispute him. Instead, he is replacing it with what the Holy Spirit has done through another. Mm -hmm. There's a good lesson in this for us, isn't it? Because the Lord tells us not to argue. Mm -hmm. And the Jewish people, as a people, you know, in their teaching even to today, they come together and they argue over the scriptures as part of their character. You know, but Paul here exhibits that there's no fruit in it. And so he shifts gear and he introduces Titus as someone who has received the Holy Spirit and is worthy as anybody else regardless. And so for us, again, a good lesson that um, getting into arguments is a waste of time. Uh, Continuing on, and this time all the people answered, Blessed be his holy name. Suddenly my aunt Mary cried out, In the name of Jesus. And I myself knelt down in front of my bench, so did others, in spontaneous worship, kneeled down. But Titus spread his arms, and the woman that had hugged him did the same face to face with Titus. Then he began to dance, two steps left, two steps right. He allowed his arms to droop like hawk's wings on the air. He raised his face and closed his eyes, then the language fountain from his mouth. Fast with force, Titus cried, Ba, 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 ba. So he's talking about speaking in tongues here. There was, as always, an amazing authority in the tone of his voice. Laughter answered him everywhere. People raised their hands in grateful worship. Simon Peter was flushed and grinning. The wind of Pentecost was blowing again. And I sang more loudly now a whole new song. Lo, how he pours, he pours out his spirit richly before our eyes. Lo, how in Christ, by grace here, he makes us heirs of eternal life. Young, blushing Titus spouted his ecstasy, ba, 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 and the room seemed brightened by fire. Then even as I was still singing, I saw Saul move to Titus. He put his arms around the lad and held him hard and long. Titus stopped speaking in tongues and soon was returning the embrace. They stood together in the midst of the people like a still and perfect centre until their steadfast silence became ours too and we all in wonder ceased our noises. Jesus Christ is Lord, Saul announced into the tangle of the young man's hair to the glory of God the Father. Then to us he all he said, You have witnessed the gift that the Holy Spirit has bestowed upon Titus. My friend speaks in tongues, and where the Spirit is, there is the favour and the presence of God. Saul paused. He stepped up on a bench and looked down at the faces turned toward him. In a gentle, in a gentle voice, oh, there's almost a slip, in a gentle voice, in a gentle voice he said, Brothers, you wouldn't say we've run in vain, Barnabas and I, would you? He placed his hand on Titus's head as if in blessing and said, Isn't this evidence that the Spirit works through us for the sake of the Gentiles, even as the same Holy Spirit works through Peter for the sake of the Jews? 
you know, with souls drawing on equality rather than separation. There was a marvellous murmur of agreement in the house. Simon Peter, husky with emotion, said, We've seen it with our own eyes. Yes, Saul. Yes, my brother. Yes. Then as a final proof that Jesus has entrusted me with the gospel to the Gentiles, I have one more thing to reveal before this assembly of the saints of Jesus. So quietly did the next words come that Saul seemed to be whispering them, but he pronounced them in perfect clarity and the people leaned forward to listen. Titus, Saul said, has not been, nor ever shall be, circumcised. Immediately, a hissing began to cut the air. A hissing, then a whistling, then we heard a fabric ripping, and I saw Judas Barsabas in his northern corner, tearing his robe and clawing at his meagre beard, spittle on his lip. No longer grey but white as death, his intensity was frightening. It made Saul's revelation seem distressful even to me, though I had agreed with him. But things that are rightly kept separate had here been driven together, tender things with harsher things. It felt like a setup, and briefly I was blaming Saul for his trick and for taking control. We were not one single man come to Jerusalem, we were a delegation. Judas Barsabas was howling in pain. Other men lamented with him, had they been burned by personal insult? Were these people genuinely grieved? I didn't know. The whole assembly seemed like a lake, caught in crosswinds, confused, choppy, unknowing. And then Barsabas found his tongue, shouting sudden burst of sentence. The Jews alone are chosen. A Gentile can be saved only if he becomes a Jew through circumcision. That makes it about as clear as we could get, doesn't it? And that shows you the issue. Judas Barsabas, the Pharisee, was standing. So clearly he's saying a Gentile can become a Jew to be a child of God through circumcision, but there's no other way. And so again, the covenant of circumcision. Judas Barsabas, the Pharisee, was standing not to teach. He would not stand to teach. He stood to accuse. Saul of Tarsus, he barked his throat thick with his wretchedness. You are striving to create a people of God outside the people of God. Saul of Tarsus, you are overthrowing the law by this faith in Jesus. Saul of Tarsus, you have therefore made the Lord Jesus an agent of sin, and all who receive your word are feeding on dust and death, while they think it is bread and life. Wow, what a strong statement. Through the storm that broke in Mary's house, through the confusion of passions and loud antagonisms, and even under the high wine of Saul's belligerent voice, I saw one clear thing and it broke my heart. In the courtyard, standing barefoot, her hands hung down in helplessness, my little Rose was crying. It had begun to rain, her face was tilted up to the clouds, but her eyes were closed and her mouth was rounded in a wolfish sorrow. I walked out of the house, I approached her. When I touched the maiden's shoulder, she jumped and I saw in her eye the flash of horror. But then she recognised me and collapsed in my arms. Someone was shouting, Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. He said it himself, the law won't pass away till heaven and earth pass away. Someone shouted still louder. He said that anyone who breaks the least commandment and any who teach others to break it will be the least in the kingdom of heaven. Little Rose with a crooked nose had buried her face in the folds of my robe. Her body shook with sobbing. Even my tunic grew warm with her tears while my shoulders grew cold with the rain. I felt huge and clumsy and filled with apology that things should come to this. So we're going to stop at that point. This isn't the end of the interaction uh, when they come together. Next lesson we'll continue on with the view of James. But it opens the door into this window of difficulty that's caused a separation between the Jews and the Gentiles. And we see the Jewish people dictating terms that only they are the true children of God. 
and only can someone be added to them if they are circumcised. Whether you realise or not, this is an Old Testament law. Mm. Abraham was called to circumcise all of the household. And when anyone as an alien came to join with the Jewish people as a nation throughout the Old Testament, they were required to be circumcised. The problem is, though, is they were required to be circumcised to be amongst them. But it didn't ever mean that they would receive any inheritance. So in other words, they would never, ever become the same as them. And Jesus came, and the prophet Isaiah makes this clear, he came for all people for, from all nations. And it wasn't a requirement that they became like the Jewish people in order to be God's children. And so in this lies this conflict. And you can imagine these people who've grown up as generations of Jewish people, they're finding this just a step too far to change. Now, in this instance, it's telling you that they're actually not required to change. Mm. The problem is not with them. The problem is that they will not accept Gentiles who will not change to be like them. And therein lies what was happening in the early church. And so today, I hope that this has sort of opened our eyes a little bit to the complexities of what church can be like. And in this, we can see that this human attitude of people that says, if you don't practice your religion like me, then you can't have faith in the Lord the same way. And therefore, you're probably not even ranked amongst the believers or the saints. And therefore, you're not saved. And of course, Barsabas makes this clear because he says that unless you're circumcised, you cannot receive salvation. And of course, that's not the message of Jesus whatsoever. All right. Mm. So we'll finish on this note. Um, a great note if you're watching to go and do some further reading of your Bible, to do some study, to read the Old Testament, learn the laws, and understand the complexities of why the laws caused people to argue amongst one another. And we must remember through all of this that Jesus made it quite clear that he didn't came to change the law, he came to fulfill the law. And so this is the part that's being missed by these people because they want people to change, to match the law. And that's not what Jesus asked. Mm -hmm.